Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's such a blessing to be here on this Sabbath morning. And one thing we all have in common is that we have life and that is something to give God thanks for. So I just want to thank everyone for tuning in to the Grace Place this morning, to all of our visitors, all of our members, anyone who is here for the first time, we welcome you to the Grace Place. There's this saying that says, there's no place like this place, so this must be the place. And I'm telling you this morning, this is the place where you want to be. I know that God has a special message in store for you, whether it's through the sermon, whether through a song, whether through the welcome, whether through special music, praise and worship, this is the place where you want to be this morning. So welcome and have a wonderful and a happy Sabbath. It is now time for scripture reading, and we will be reading from Luke, verse, oh, Luke 11, verses 5 to 8. And again, that is Luke 11 verses five to eight and it reads then jesus said to them suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say friend lend me three loaves of bread a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and i have no food to offer him and suppose the one inside answers don't bother me the door is already locked and my children and i are in bed I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm glad that we're all here. And uh, hi, Ms. Jeanette. This is a time for our corporate prayer. And I look forward to doing that. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, first and foremost, for waking us up this morning, for giving us strength in our limbs to get out of the bed, to shower, shave, prepare ourselves, so that we may gather together to call upon the name of Jesus the Christ, indeed, God Himself. Father, as we listen to the what is going on around us because we are not we are not blind to what is happening in this world but we are also in danger while we are not blind we're also in danger lord of looking at all of the problems all of the challenges on the outside and indeed we see that we ourselves are not enough to face these challenges on our own we need each other we need our communities of faith. We need our church brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, aunts, and uncles. We need everyone. Indeed, we need you, Jesus Christ, above all self, above all else. We ask you this morning, O oh Lord, to send your Holy Spirit to, to take us, Lord, and to give us what we need, even as we, he leads us into giving us what we need to strengthen others as he strengthens us. The word of the Lord says we are strong, courageous, and firm. We fear not and are not in terror, for it is the Lord our God who goes with us. He will not fail us or forsake us. Deuteronomy 31, 6. God reminds us that in our days of trouble, for there will be many, we will call to you, for you will answer us. We especially thank you, Lord, for the privilege of having you search us and to know our hearts, to try us and to know our anxieties and see if there are any wicked ways in us and lead us into the way everlasting because you are God are the one who will do that and continues to do that. This morning, Lord, we look around at each other. Been we were in our uh, breakout rooms. We heard the heartfelt prayers. But Father, this morning, for all of us who are in need of whatever it is we need, in whoever we need, we call upon the name of Jesus the Christ right now in this place and thank him. We thank him, Lord, for the mighty miracles he's, you've wrought. We thank you, O oh God, for how you have touched us. We thank you, O oh God, that even when we don't know where we're going or where we're coming from, we know that you are still with us and that you will not leave us nor forsake us. Now, Father, as we see each other, 
as we hear each other, we know that you are seeing and hearing us and that your only desires for us to be with you. I want to share this, oh God, this morning with you. We are in need of that great belonging. And that great belonging is only found in you. It doesn't matter what each of us has or doesn't have. We all need to believe and accept that we belong not just to the family of God, but to God himself. We belong to each other. So Father, this morning, I lift us all up with our prayers, our needs, whether it's for healing, physical, emotional, or spiritual healing. I lift us up, Lord, for those of us who are in need of financial resources, those of us who need physical resources, those of us who are in need of just coming face to face with God and allowing God to touch our heart. Grant it to us because we belong to you. We belong to each other. We belong to Jesus the Christ. Now, oh Lord, we lift up the speaker, the one who will break bread, the bread that you have given. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would get real with all of us. Get real with that person. Get real so that we, when we leave and come off of this Zoom gathering, that we will not be the same. That we will be excited about living for God. No, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We lift Jesus the Christ up and ask him to sit on the throne of our hearts. And may he, as he always wants to do, lead us in your paths everlasting. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we all pray. Amen and amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let me see if I put it on gallery view so I can see everybody. And I think you don't see me. Oh, let's see. So I want to read, I want to start by reading a scripture text, and then we're going to go into our story. So our scripture comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 21, or reading verse 21. So again, it's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And this is what it reads. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'm going to read that one more time because it's just it's so exciting. So let me read it one more time. So I need you to repeat with me so that you'll know where to find this when you need to go back to the scripture. So it's 2 Corinthians. Can you say 2 Corinthians? Okay. 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and this is what it reads. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How many guys, how many you guys like candy? Anybody like candy? Anybody like candy? I'm going to show you guys something that is, it's an old candy. It's an old candy. I saw this the other day. It's an old candy. Guys, have guys ever seen this candy? Does anybody know this candy? Is anyone familiar with this candy? Ah, uh, yeah, a lot of folks are saying, no, I do not know this candy. Well, this connects, this scripture ties to this candy. So, I, when I was a little girl, I, I want you guys to know, I was raised with my cousins, and, and we lived all in the same house, so it was like five of us. But my mom, she went out one day and she purchased candy. She purchased candy that she was going to give us after dinner. We were excited. She was going to give us candy after dinner. She bought Kit Kat. So, she, so since it was five kids in the house, she bought, you know, I think she got like seven pieces of seven different candies, but for five of us. And so she got Kit Kat, Snickers, Twizzlers, you, I mean, uh, Hershey, she had. She had three musketeers. She had all this different candy. And this candy was also a part of the pack. This piece of this called, it called Chuckles. I don't know if you guys remember the little jelly candies. I didn't like them, like the little orange wedges, and they were soaked in, in sugar. Didn't really care for them. But this was Chuckles, and it had, it had cherry and lemon and grape and orange and lime. So these are all the flavors. Well, 
Well, my mom went to go get the candy. She was going to give it to us after dinner. And she goes to get the candy. And guess what? It's missing. All the chocolate is there. But Chuckles was missing. Chuckles was missing. Well, my mom was not happy about that. And so she pulled us all together and she asked and she, she, she questioned us, who stole the candy? Well, we're all like, we don't know who stole the candy. I didn't take the candy. Did you take the candy? I didn't take the candy. Did you take the candy? And we're all saying we didn't take the candy, but somebody took the candy. So my mother said, fine. Since I can't figure out who took the candy, everybody will get a beat. Everybody. If I, and so her thing was, I'll get the right one. <laughs> I'll get the right one. If I can't get, if I don't know which one, I'm going to get the right one. And so therefore, all of you guys will get in trouble. All of you guys are going to get a spanking over this candy that was missing. Now, in my mind, I was like, I need to say up front, I did not take the candy. But for me, it wasn't fair that everybody was going to get spanked because one individual decided that they would steal from my mom. It was just not fair to me that all of us were going to get a beaten because of one individual breaking a rule. So with that being said, I stood up and said, I took the candy. Now, I didn't take it, but it wasn't fair in my mind that everybody would have to get in trouble for one person's actions. But I was willing to take the punishment so that nobody else would have to take it, even though there was a guilty one among us. He was going to get off. He was going to get off scot-free because I was going to take his punishment. I was going to take his punishment. I didn't deserve the punishment. I didn't do the crime. But I was willing to take the punishment so that everybody else would be spared from the beating. I took it. I took the punishment. Later it came out that my cousin was the one who stole it. He was like, you stole it too? I was like, I didn't steal anything. I took it because I didn't want you guys to get in trouble. Wow, I ended up getting in trouble anyway, twice, because my mom was like, well, you took, a, you took a beating that didn't have to take you live for everybody else. That's not the point. But when I thought about this one day, the Lord brought this thing back to my memory about how I decided that it wasn't fair that everybody was going to have to take a punishment for one person's crime. It just didn't seem right to me. And God brought it to me. He was like, do you know, that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Because one person messed up, everybody was going to have to take this punishment of death. But look what the word says. Jesus says, I will stand up and I will take the punishment so that they don't have to have the penalty of dying. I will take it on myself. This is what Christ says. And this is why the scripture is so great for us. It says, for he made him who knew no sin. He wasn't guilty. He knew he was not guilty, but it says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, those who were guilty, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, Chuckles, just so happened the other day, after God had reminded me of the story, would you believe that very same day that God had reminded me of the story? I went to Hardy's and I was standing and getting in line and guess what was there in line? Chuckles. Something that I have not seen in 20 plus years. I have not seen this candy in 20 plus years. And there it was. And I knew at that moment that God wanted me to share this story with you guys so that you would be reminded that he took the penalty for us. The one who was innocent, the one who was not, who was not guilty, took our penalty of death and sin so that we might have claim to the tree of life in his righteousness. God is so good. He loves us so much that he would take what is due to us, our sin and our death. Lord, we thank you. We can chuckle about this now, that you would love us so much that you would die in our place, taking upon yourself the penalty of our guilt and our sin, that you will be willing to say, I will take the punishment so that they can go free. God, thank you for loving us. And thank you for this word that reminds us how much you do love us. We praise you, we bless you, and we thank you for Jesus dying in our stead. It's in his name we pray, amen.
May you guys be blessed. And may you remember the next time you see this on the shelf, that God died for you so that you wouldn't have to take the penalty of sin. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Grace Place family. I am so happy to come once again and join in singing with you. Today I have my brothers here, Pastor Ariel Delgado, Pastor Eliphaz Omonte, and Pastor Josias Flores. So we'll be joining our voices to glorify our Father in heaven. This first song, all the kids know it. I know that Gabby loves it and, and you know it very well. So join us as we sing Mighty the Same.
Through prayer, we have a relationship with God and we can take anything that is burning, burning in our hearts and He will take it and help us through that. Our last song is like a prayer. It's called Heart of Worship and also it will sing Draw Me Close. Um, for me personally, I don't feel worthy of being in God's presence to sing, to be called a pastor or a Christian. It's too high of a calling. But He gives us the strength through the Holy Spirit. Our our job is just to worship Him because that's what He accepts. Our broken songs, our broken voices, but He wants that. He wants our hearts. So I invite you to join us as we sing Heart of Worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply
I am so very grateful for what God has done and is doing at the Grace Place. Every single year, he brings incredible people from the seminary to help us fulfill the mission he's given us to reach out to the community, to be uniquely better at servicing the community and worshiping him. He has brought people with gifts in technology, in media, in sound and audiovisual, and all of these different ways. And he's also brought men and women to teach us lessons in characteristics of godliness. And that's perhaps the greatest lesson or speaker has taught me. Pastor Silas Young is one of the most humble servants of God I've ever known. And it's not a fake humility. It is so authentic. It touches your heart in a special way. This is one of the things that most people do not know about him. He is a fantastic artist, but he never blows his trumpet about it. He came into a culture that's unlike his own, not just at the seminary, but at the Grace Place, a worship style that is so alien to what he was raised with. But you would never know. You would think that he was born doing what we're doing because of his deep sense of godliness and humility. And I know that he's one of the anointed servants of God, and it gives me great pleasure to have had him as part of our training for um, ministry here at the Grace Place. So please prayerfully, thoughtfully, and inspirationally welcome our speaker, Pastor Silas Young. Thank you, Pastor Heifetz, uh, for your uh, introduction to me. I am so grateful that I can join the Grace Place family, and I think it's too late for me. I should have come way earlier, because uh, uh, since I came, I've, I've always felt uh, energizing and powerful worship experience from songs, from sermons and from all the support from uh, my family member and it is a great honor that i can um, share god's word uh, with you um, it's not my message it's the lord's message and i am also taught by him i am very uh, grateful that we can still have worship experience uh, even in zoom but we they'll pray that we have uh, in-person worship soon so we can see each other um, face to face. Um, today, we will continue with a parable of Jesus. This is a parable that Jesus used to help us to understand things and how he will act when we pray to him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may you reveal your words to us May the Holy Spirit be with us. May we have wisdom to understand your parable and we put it into action. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we have read the text from Luke chapter 11, verse five to eight. It is a pretty, um, I would say it's easy to understand, but at the same time, there is some more depth in it that we can explore. In verse 5, Jesus says, And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves? And we will continue with the story later. So what happened? What's the intention that Jesus brought up, brought up this parable? Let's look at the context of Luke chapter 11. Um, so when we read verse one, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. 
So the context was that one disciple saw Jesus pray, maybe in the morning, maybe in a uh, special time, and he felt urged to ask Jesus, teach us to pray. How do you pray? So why did he ask um, Jesus to teach him to pray? He gave the, um, the intention that he, he saw John the Baptist also taught his disciples to pray, not only about how, uh, what we should speak to God, but also the habits that we should have. For example, John the Baptist used to lead his disciples to fast and pray, maybe um, several times a month or even a few times a day. So this disciple of Jesus saw Jesus just role model as a prayer warrior. We know that Jesus would wake up so early to pray um, before his ministry. Maybe this disciple also thinks that his master has a power to pray. Um, some church members uh, will always say, uh, ask the pastor to pray for him or her because he, he or she thinks that uh, the pastor has more power to pray to God and maybe it's out of the concept of power distance. They think that um, pastors are closer to God so that through pastor, they can also come close to God. Or maybe they think that uh, pastoral prayers, uh, the prayer from pastors are more beautiful. One church member used to ask, uh, why did I have a, such a wonderful prayer? While I didn't think so, but maybe it's the words, it's the style of um, prayer, prayer that makes people think that some prayers are more uh, powerful or more beautiful from others. So maybe the reason why the disciple came to Jesus and asked uh, Jesus to teach him to pray. And then Jesus did not fail him. He gave a beautiful format of prayer to him, which we later called, call it the famous Lord's Prayer. But actually, this is meant to be the disciples' prayer because this is the format that Jesus gave to that disciple to follow and to learn the spiritual principles in it. And Jesus may, may also expect the disciple not to only follow the format or to read it word by word, but also expect the disciples to extract principles and elaborate. We have more examples of prayer and application from Jesus because we, when we see Jesus' long prayer in, after the Last Supper, we saw many more details and very intimate wordings that Jesus shared with his Father. So when we read verse 5, then we know that in the context of teaching how to pray, this is the intention that why Jesus taught this, this parable. So when, when we read again in, from verse 5, And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Verse 6, For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. So let me look into this story and see the details. First, it starts with, Which of you? Who has a friend. Jesus taught parables with live example, with something that the disciples and the crowd you will experience. So it is a common scene that some friends will come maybe from the desert or from other cities to ask for a place to, to stay overnight. But this friend came at midnight so isn't it, isn't it not very convenient? Suppose we are in a um, very peaceful night and someone knock on our door. We may, we may also hesitate to not to open the door. But we know that this friend 
arrived on a journey. This friend is tired. This friend is thirsty. This friend is hungry. Then you may think, maybe I should open the door for him. But let me, let me, let us think about um, the friend who knock on door and asking for bread to, to share with his guest. Why is this so important to, to treat the guest? Maybe the guest should um, go somewhere else to find uh, a hotel or something. Actually, it is the culture in the Middle East to treat guests from a journey. It is so important. When we read Genesis 18, there's a story that Abraham urged to welcome the Lord's messenger and gave them water to wash their feet and bread to eat. It may not be very common, um, maybe in my country, in my city, which is Hong Kong, we don't usually go to someone's house um, and ask for a place to stay and ask for food. It may be more common in the US. Uh, I was surprised when I was canvassing that people really answered my door and talked to me and would even invite me to uh, enter their home and have some drinks. It is especially more, uh, more common in the Middle East culture. Not only so, it, is act it was actually a legal obligation. The host has to treat the guest when they come. So maybe the, the, the friend who, who saw his friend, um, he felt the obligation or he may fear uh, punishment or some impoliteness. But do we treat it as an obligation to help others? Oftentimes when I was uh, serving at the church and felt tired and my non-Christian friends would come to me and, and say, Okay, you don't have to do that much. You are not paid anyways. Just take a rest. Even some Christians may think themselves as volunteers and thinking that going to church is a charity and helping others uh, is something that they can choose. When they have time, they, will, they can help more. When they don't, they can just take a rest or they can go to work and study. And more, more importantly, they may expect a thank you when they serve God, and they may expect uh, the church to appreciate their work. But what does Jesus say here? We can also read uh, Matthew chapter 24, 25, verse 35. Jesus says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. In that chapter, Jesus explained that it is our obligation to help others. This is also the way that we serve God. Not only is it obligation, if we only serve people because we, we think that it is our responsibility and we do it without a merry heart, it is something that we don't want. We also want that we have an empathetic heart to feel the need of others. So going back to the parable, the guest came at midnight. Maybe um, it is not what he wants. Um, he may have, he may want that he already finds a place to stay. It's maybe also, it may also, uh, because it is urgent that he can not find a motel or somewhere. And he is tired, he is thirsty. So when the friend see, sees him, he may truly feel his need and he cannot help wanting to provide whatever he needs right now. But the problem is he has nothing. So in verse six, he says, and I have nothing to provide for my friend to set before him. Why does he has, have nothing to provide. Um, we uh, will have a lot of food, a lot of like instant noodles or something in our house that we store for ourselves and for guests. But why does he have nothing? Maybe he has not, no time to prepare, or maybe he is a poor family. 
the result is for sure that he has nothing and it is at midnight he cannot go buy something he cannot go to prepare something more so let us think let us uh step into his shoes what are his options option one he actually can ask this guest to leave to find someone else who is uh, rich who has more food or option two he can force him to stay but give him nothing to eat and say to him it's late at night uh, maybe when you sleep you don't feel hungry anymore and option three is what appears in the parable and ah he has something he has a friend who has bread and he can just get out of his his bed and run to his friend's uh, house and borrow bread from him in the audience angle especially as christians we of course expect him to pick the third option but isn't the first two or at least the first one also reasonable in real situation when you have no money someone comes to you and wants to borrow for say uh ten hundred uh ten hundred dollars from you and you can just say i'm sorry but i don't have that money to lend you do we also have these three options when we do ministry when someone comes to church asking for spiritual bread we can say um we don't have anything that fits your spiritual need um see you all you you don't you don't seem satisfied with our church maybe you can find another church or we can say we don't have anything that fits your spiritual need but hey we have fun we have entertainment you can stay we can make friends stay with us although we don't have spiritual breath for you it is sometimes easy to realize that we actually have nothing to contribute to the ministry but it is not always easy to realize we can ask for help from this one and only source of spiritual gifts and it is always easy to say i have nothing so i quit serving i heard from a uh, former leader who shared with me that uh, the reason why he quit uh, being a group leader he said is tiring it is it doesn't like seem rewarding and i don't have anything to serve serve the the, the sheep sometimes inferior inferiority can be a form of self-centeredness to the point that one denies the transforming power of god and forgets the importance of the principle that we should be christ-centered so having failed to get out of some sort of sense of self-pity one may think that god can never make him or herself better or sometimes even i would think uh, god is too busy blessing others uh, someone who is more talented and more devoted and god may have no time to take care of um, my lesser need and I, since i'm weak i don't deserve anything and maybe i, I would think i'm not close enough to uh, to god that's the reason why he will not bless me more maybe that's the one thought that jesus also uh, noticed among the disciples thinking that god's grace is limited uh, when they pray, God's answer would be um, like, wait or no, you don't deserve it. Maybe Jesus knew that this thought may be lethal to their spiritual life. So Jesus shared this parable with them and teach them. So may we re continue to read the parable starting uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 7. Thinking that God would answer like this and he will answer from within do not bother me the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed i cannot get up and give you anything so can we imagine that god will answer our prayer like this what an act inaccurate image of god picture him as lazy denying and only loving his chosen children and ignoring others needs no not like that at all. Jesus said, don't even think about it. 
Even the humans are not like that. In verse 8, Jesus continued, and he said, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Jesus said, even you will do that. Even when you see friends in need, you will help. How much more God will help us? Let us explain um, the condition in the Middle, ancient Middle East. The house layout is uh, maybe not as what we think, which is big. We have two uh, floors. Actually, the house is pretty small. When we uh, Google search the relics of the city in, in, in the ancient times, we, can, we, we cannot imagine how small the house was, just like it was in Hong Kong, actually. Um, and the bedroom, so-called bedroom, is actually a, just a floor uh, with a carpet, and the whole family sleep together, will sleep together. And the door is very close to uh, the, 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 the so-called bedroom. So when a friend knock on door and shout, actually, he can literally wake up everyone and even the neighbors. And it's very um, impolite to do that. And so we can um, just imagine um, how troubled the household will, will be. They are already in bed and with their children. Maybe they are, ho are hugging each other. It's very cozy, but um, someone knocks on door and it, it is in, at midnight. Maybe they are in their sweet, sweet dreams and they are, they are waking up. So Jesus says, even in such a situation, you will not ignore your friend's urgent request. So how much more will God answer your request? And do we think that the man who knocks on door know that he will disturb the household sleep? I think, yes, he definitely know that, but he still does it. Not only so, he does it with impudence. He, so in our culture, uh, I'm from a Chinese culture, we ask, uh, we, we request people to do something for us or we ask for help with a very polite and indirect way. I know in English it di is different. Um, maybe in an email when we ask for our ac academic advisors to, to, to help us something, we would say, uh, dear sir, madam, I would greatly appreciate if you could do something for me. But in Chinese, we would say um, more indirectly, like we, we may start with, hey, long time, no see. Have you had dinner yet? How are your kids doing? Um, yeah, nothing special at all. Just wondering if it happens that you have three extra bread in your house. Yeah, I know God has blessed you so much. You're so kind person. And we still haven't um, started to, to bring up our request. So, but in this story, the friend, the, uh, the friend who knocks on door actually um, just straight out expresses his need. I need free breath. Please let me. Um, it's an imperative and it's also a pleading. It's a very direct and as we read in the, uh, in the version, it says it's a shameless request. So why does he do that? Why does he come to the um, friend's house to ask in a very, uh, not a very impolite, a very polite way. Maybe he cares for his own need and also his guests need more than his uh, self-esteem. Maybe he cares about uh, the guest needs and if truly feels stirred up in his heart that he needs some bread to treat his guest. I remember when I started to feel uh, called to serve God in Adventist youth uh, ministry, it was because of a thought that I, I saw the teens in need. And, 
and th- and thought if there is someone who show love, who care and give guidance to those teenagers who and those teenagers are suffering from study pressure, not knowing their future, and even having poor or even broken family relationship. That if I, as a big brother, could show them hope and strength that can they, they could find in God, I could change their lives forever. Because I also experienced um, someone helped me and directed a different path that changed my whole life. When I saw their needs, when I heard their cries, I felt called to do something for them. And oftentimes when I felt I couldn't help them much, uh, I was also growing. I didn't know much to, to counsel them. I would pray to God in a very impolite way. I would say, God, please do something. I have no idea what to do. I know you're real. I know you have answered prayers, but could you please answer my prayer? I want some bread. I want some spiritual blessing to give them. Don't fail them. Please help me. When I um, uh, thought about my experience, it was pretty impolite. And uh, actually, I, I prayed with doubts. But this is because I feel the need that I need to help them. So let us continue with the parable. In verse 8, it says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. This is what God thinks when we pray to him, no matter what we pray. And let us focus on he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Whatever he needs is such a promise. But let us think, uh, let us reflect on our own prayer life and our experience. It is something that whatever he needs or whatever he wants, it is the same thing or different things. I don't have a, uh, for myself, a really obvious answer. And I, th- and I believe that uh, even in our lives, um, it, it can lead to open-ended answers because God is not a computer. God is not a robot. And if we input A and he will answer B, no, it's not like that. He is a God. He is a personal God. And he answers um, our prayers or each other's prayers in different ways. So sometimes maybe what we need is what we pray for and it's what we want. And we may uh, have a answer that we desire. But oftentimes it, what we ask for is what we want, but what not God, uh, what God think that, uh, that we need. And when we ask, we ask something that we think we deserve. For example, in this parable, he asked just for three breads. What if he asked four breads? He may have extra to feed his family as well, but he just asked uh, three breads. And Jesus says he will receive whatever he needs or he asks for. So sometimes uh, God will answer our prayers according to what we request. Um, for, uh, there, there's a, a joke that, we, that I had with my friend. Um, she, so I think uh, a couple of months ago, she went to take the vaccine. Uh, so this is not to say, uh, uh, to, to judge uh, taking vaccine or not is uh, biblical or not, it's not that. But uh, she asked, uh, God to um, to let him to to to, to let her uh, be well or had no symptoms at all uh, during the exam and after the, the exam uh, that that she may have some symptoms then we, then we we laughed at her that uh, and said that actually you can pray that you have no symptom at all because God is powerful but you ask for symptoms after your exam. So it's like um, we ask that according to what we think God will give, 
but not according to what he can do. Um, in some other times, our answers are not answered in the way that we want. I, I recently read about uh, a testimony from a missionary in China, uh, and her name is Rosalind Go Goforth. He, she, so there was many difficult situations uh, back in uh, the past century. Um, and she brought her child to China and her child was sick. And she prayed that um, God could heal her, her child, but to no avail. She also prayed for other families' child and, the ch and that child recovered. So sometimes we may think God is not fair, God doesn't answer prayers. But maybe um, when we feel frustrated, when we feel unanswered, it is because we don't understand how God works. When we uh, continue to live and look back to our, to, to our past, we, we may see clearer how God leads our life. Jesus says in verse nine, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you. He continues in verse 11, what well, father among you, he, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So now we see that God has a bigger picture and he will not give us what, what hurts us. But what if we ask, uh, when we need fish, we ask, for a serpent? What if we need an uh, egg, but we ask instead scorpion? So you know, it's, it's actually uh, a, a pretty good uh, um, image illustration because the dry little fish that they carry is like a serpent. And the egg is actually like a white scorpion. If the scorpion just curl itself, it's like an egg. So sometimes uh, what we want, but not what God wants to give us, is very similar to something that we truly need and something that God wants to give us. But we don't know, we don't understand. We, think, we may think that, um, yeah, this is something in the Bible. Uh, uh, someone, maybe uh, Jesus or Moses or some disciples also had it. Why can't I have it now? And we all know that um, there are, Often three answers um, that we may receive when we pray is yes, no, and wait. And sometimes, uh, or in this parable, Jesus was saying that there, are, there is the fourth answer. is yes, but, but there's something more. Because when we focus on our wants, our needs, thinking that it is what God wants to give us right away, it may be, may be that it's not according to what the schedule that God wants to lead our life. Jesus finished with verse 13. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Although we may have, have uh, although um, Jesus shared first, he shared a, the Lord's Prayer and two parables, but the most important theme that Jesus wanted the disciples to understand is that the very first and most important thing that we can pray for is the Holy Spirit, is something that we need. Is the point that Jesus bring, brings out that we need to realize that we have nothing to give when we serve, except for uh, until we ask Jesus, until we ask God to give us the Holy Spirit. When we feel urged to help others, we need to ask the source of power and strength. In Matthew chapter 6, 
verse 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Maybe we are troubled in our situations. Maybe we need financial uh, help. Maybe we need a good relationship. Maybe we need a good result in academic, academically. But we may never forget that we are Christians. We need to serve others. And through serve others, we also receive our, our needs, what we want. And remember that what we can receive from God is not something that we lend, uh, that we borrow, or something that we loan from God. It's absolutely a gift. It's purely something that He gives us with no cost. Whenever we ask, we receive. But in the context that we go out to help others, it's not a um, selfish prayer that we always pray for uh, uh, ourselves and not pray for others. It's to realize that we have friends around us that are in need. When we feel lonely, there are someone who has no family, who lives with just him or herself, with no one to even to talk to. When we feel unloved, there are someone who uh, have been abandoned by their family. There are always someone who have more need than us. When we feel that we need something, it is a blessing because we can have empathy on those who have the same need as ours. So the whole parable is to teach us that God answers prayer. So we need to learn God, learn from God also that we can answer others' prayer. We can be the messenger of God. We can fulfill what they need, just as God has helped us as always. <music>